In the name of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. Gospel of St. John, chapter 8. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, Jesus speaks to these Jews who had believed him, and we see how quickly their faith comes to an end. One little word felled them. Slaves. Actually, Jesus didn't even have to use the word slaves. He just had to talk about them being set free. And notice how these Jews who had believed him responded when he said that. We're Abraham's sons. We're not illegitimate children. We've never been slaves of anyone. Isn't it true that you're demon-possessed? By the end of John chapter 8, these Jews who had believed him are holding stones in their hands to stone Jesus. They simply didn't see themselves as enslaved. Now, we could quibble with their view of history quite easily. We could remind them of centuries spent in slavery in Egypt. We could bring to their memory the time of exile in Assyria and Babylon, and we could note for them that at that very moment, they happened to be serving another master, the Romans who occupy their land. Of course, since Jesus wasn't actually speaking historically, but spiritually, maybe his listeners, these Jews who had believed him, were answering in kind. They were answering in spiritual terms. Jesus tells us that he's talking about, as he clarified, slavery to sin. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And these Jews who believed him say, but we're following the faith of Abraham. You can't be talking to us. You must be talking to some other poor schmucks who are slaves. Again, that's usually how we see it. We feel like we've made all the right choices. We're right where we want to be, right where we intend to be. We are notoriously hard to convince, in our parlance, of addiction. Because we just don't see it. I've got everything under control, we say. So Jesus engages in what we might call a little bit of an intervention. He says to them, doing the sin equals being a slave to the sin. And notice how particular he gets. He doesn't paint with a broad brush here and talk about sinning in general. He doesn't talk about sins, plural. He talks about the sin. This is his hard truth, his big truth. This is the surrounded by flashing neon light truth that he has for them. I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Literally what he said is everyone doing the sin is a slave to the sin. No, 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 no. That that can't be right, we say. I get it if you're talking about a general predilection. I get it if you're talking about a compulsion, a, a habit in life. You know, one of those things we call an addiction. But this? The sin? That one I'm committing right now? It's not really as crazy as you think, this idea Jesus has, that sin, any sin, makes you a slave to sin, to that sin? Think how bound to sin, any sin you want to think of, think how bound to sin we become so quickly. We waste our money on it. We waste our time on it. We lie about it. We connive to get it. We hurt people to have it or maintain it. Luther says stunningly in a series of sermons on this text, it is vain for you to sin and still expect to be free. And all the while, we maintain our status as believers. I'm a child of Christ. While at the same time, we're carving out our Montana-sized exemption for ourselves so that we can trumpet to everyone, I'm not like that guy, I believe. But we're living in cloud cuckoo land. We're living in a state of denial, a state of untruth. We say it isn't all that bad. It's under control. 
could always be worse. Except Jesus comes to us today and says, it is as bad as it gets. You know what slaves are. Slaves have no place in the family. Slaves are nothing. Slaves are unpeople, unpersons. Slaves are seen and not heard. They're property, easily acquired, easily discarded, worked until death. Listen to some of the things Jesus says to these Jews who had believed him over the course of John chapter 8. You do not know me or my father. You will look for me and you will die in your sin. You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. No wonder they picked up stones to stone him, these Jews who had believed him. Because Jesus tells them, you're not quite the sons and children you thought you were. They didn't yet know the truth. They followed Jesus, sure. They even believed in him. They believed in him right up until that moment when Jesus said something that bothered them. A repeat of what happens in John chapter 6. There, Jesus talks to this crowd, this crowd of eager and excited followers. He says, you're just following your stomachs. You don't care about me. All you care about is one more meal to fill your stomach, one more miraculous meal. And then he started pointing them away from that food, away from themselves to himself. And he says, I'm God's food. I am the bread of life. My flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. Whoever eats and drinks that has everlasting life. And you know what they did? They accused him of promoting cannibalism. We do the very same thing. We believe. Oh, we believe. We believe. Right up until that moment, Jesus bothers us. Right up until that moment when the rubber hits the road. Right up until that moment when he tells me I'm not quite as good as I think I am. Right up until the moment when he tells me that pet behavior, that thing I enjoy, it's not something I should enjoy. It's something I should stop because it's wrong. It's sinful. You're wrong. You're sinful. Right up until that moment when he tells me all the things I'm doing, all my great plans for appeasing God aren't really up to snuff. Faith is holding to the words and teachings of Jesus. Only then, Jesus says, do those three things he talked about happen. You are my disciples. You know the truth. And the truth will set you free. And it's only and all Jesus. Anything that is not God's son, Luther said in that same series of sermons, anything that is not God's son will not make me free. In Egypt, Abraham feared losing his beautiful wife, Sarah, to a lecherous Pharaoh. More than that, he feared losing his wife because he figured Pharaoh would just detach a husband from the situation. So instead of trusting God's promise, a promise that said, all nations will be blessed through you, Abraham, that is, through a son that comes from you and through the womb of your wife, Sarah, instead of trusting in that promise, A promise to Abraham that says, you will survive, come what may. Instead, Abraham says to his wife, say that you're my sister. Coward. Pig. He lets Pharaoh flirt with his wife. He lets Pharaoh take his wife to be his sexual plaything. Instead of trusting in the promise of God. Thankfully, God delivered Sarah, didn't let Pharaoh use Sarah sexually, but no thanks to Abraham. Abraham remained a slave. Abraham looked outside of God and his promises. Abraham looked outside of God's son. Abraham could sit on the toilet, but he couldn't push anything out. Again, as Luther says, we must progress to the point where we say God has promised. Abraham failed in this. The Jews who believed in Jesus failed in this. They could not abide that word from Jesus' lips, slaves. And so they couldn't, or they wouldn't, 
handle the truth. How hard it is, isn't it? To say only God has promised. We can barely get out of, the, out of bed in the morning based on that. God has promised. With that in a quarter, you can't even make a phone call or buy a cup of coffee anymore. So God has to do it. Without us. And he does it. His son Jesus says it. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Here comes Jesus with his words. And there's so few. We can give hours away in talk therapy, talking about our hopes and our dreams and our fears and our, our rationalizations, our explanations, our misunderstandings. And every once in a while we might even throw a confession for variety's sakes. God just says, my son. And it's the transfiguration word, my son. I love him. I chose him. I give him to you. Listen to him. Luther was fond of this analogy. He said, if you knew of a doctor who could cure every disease, who could bring someone back from the dead, wouldn't you run to that doctor? Wouldn't you spend any amount of money it took to get to that doctor and his treatment? Wouldn't you stand in line as long as it takes to get what that doctor has? Of course you would. And here's Jesus, holding in his hands the cure, offering the cure, telling the truth, speaking the truth, speaking his words. If the Son would free you, and the only hypothetical in that conditional statement is you, where are you? I know where Jesus is. I know where the freedom is. Just like an alcoholic knows where the rehab center is. And that overeating glutton, he knows where the garbage can is too. The problem is my slavery. It is more deeply set in than any addiction known to man. It isn't just in me. It is me. Except the sun sets you free. The sun comes and he tells you about your condition. He exposes your condition, and then he offers the cure, and it is himself. This is the amazing freedom that the practice of private confession and absolution gives. It's why our Lutheran fathers and our Lutheran confessions extol it so much. We hear the word confession, and we think, Catholic, Pope, no! But our Lutheran fathers used confession their entire lives, and when they heard it, they thought, this is the place where God finally tells me the truth. You are slaves, and I free you. This is the place where God makes his appeal to you. Slaves, be reconciled. This is the place where Paul makes his appeal to you, where he tells you his words. God made him who had no sin to be sin for you, so that in him you might become the righteousness of God. Now is the day of God's favor. Now is the day of God's salvation. Whether those words are spoken to you by a pastor or by one of your fellow Christians, because confession is about getting to the absolution. Confession is about the forgiveness. Confession is nothing other than hearing and holding to the words of Jesus. Slave sin, I free you. We look at confession and see it as nothing except another papal chore. Instead, it is simply sons being free. In one of his other writings, Luther exhorted Christians to confession. He said, when I urge you to go to confession, I'm doing nothing else than urging you to be a Christian. Christians confess. Christians have the true hunger and thirst. Christians reach for the bread because Christians know their hunger. Christians know their thirst. Christians know their slavery. Christians know their sin. Last time, Luther. In other words, as a deer with anxious and trembling eagerness strains towards a fresh flowing stream, so I yearn anxiously and tremblingly for God's word, absolution, the sacrament, and so forth. Jesus offers freedom. His words, his actions, his truth. Jesus comes 
that great doctor, and he brings the really real. He brings the real Abrahamic faith. He makes us sons again because he bound himself to our slavery. He became a slave to sin. He became a slave to death. And then he confessed our sins to his father and claimed them as his very own. And in the resurrection of Christ, God declared absolution. He declared the very same absolution that by Christ's authority I've declared to you. I forgive you your sins for the sake of Christ. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time of God's favor. Here, today, now. An end to slavery. For Christ puts an end to our sin. He put an end to it on the cross once for all and then repeats it over and over and over again, daily and fully, as often as we need. His word, his truth. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. He did. He does. He made you a person again. No longer a slave, but a son. And not only a son, but an heir. An heir of resurrection and life. His words. His truth. We have them. We hold them. Amen.